you guys can hear me okay. Is this on? Awesome. All right, we want to do a little stretch. I know it's been, we've heard a bunch of really exciting talks. If you want to put your hands up and just stretch it out, I like to do a little stretch before I talk, and maybe it's nice to do a little stretch before you um, hear a little bit about um, empowering girls through playful design. And before we jump right in, I wanted to ask, um, actually ask you to close your eyes. I'm going to ask you a question and just have you think about it. And that question is, what problem in the world keeps you up at night? This could be anything. There are a lot of problems in our world. OK, and once you have an answer, raise your hand. You've thought of something. Something's in your head. I'm not going to ask you to tell me. It's just, you know, you thought of something. Some of you are happy that I'm not going to call on you. OK. All right, I'm going to ask you one more question. So keep your eyes closed. And that question is, what were you doing the last time you found flow? And flow is that state of mind where we can lose hours doing what we're doing because we're so engaged. We're having such a great time. We've totally lost track of time. It's been several hours. We're still doing that thing that we love. What were you doing the last time you found flow? And once you have that in your brain, raise your hand so I know you're thinking about something. All right. For the purpose of time, I won't be asking for volunteers, but I'd really love to hear your answers later. And I felt like it wouldn't be fair to um, ask you these questions without telling you mine first. But um, before we get into that, why am I asking you these two things? You can open your eyes if they're still closed. Um, these two questions start to lead us to two different things. The first question I asked you was about a problem that keeps you up at night. And in some ways, that's an area of change that you might care about creating in the world. And this may relate to a project that you're already working on, or this may just be a problem that you think about that bothers you. Maybe it frustrates you. You're like, why haven't we figured this out yet? And in some ways, that problem gives us a hint towards what we might call our purpose that area of change that we might want to create. And the second question I asked you was about finding that sense of flow, um, which is really about an activity or a skill or a hobby that you can do for hours, right? In some ways, what if we see that as a pathway? Maybe a pathway towards bringing that purpose to life. And I feel like when we bring these two areas together, something magical can happen. And my purpose is around, oh, excuse me. Um, there's one area that I want to talk about bringing into um, your purpose and pathway. So when you bring these two areas together, what I'd like to discuss today are ways that we can include play in that process, ways that we can integrate play into the process of bringing together our purpose and our pathway, and we'll even talk about ways that play could potentially be the pathway in itself. So. Uh, my purpose is around empowering girls. I grew up here in the Bay Area. I went to an all-girls school for seven years where our school's motto was women learning, women leading. So we, th we thought about um, the power of girls to change the world all the time. Most of my teachers were female. Most of our speakers at school were female. Um, I felt like I, had, I was surrounded by amazing role models of female change makers. And I kept thinking to myself, God, if really, if a girls have the power to run the world, then why is it that women are still heavily underrepresented across industries in leadership? And why is it that millions of girls around the world are still being held back from going to school and not receiving the education and the resources that they deserve to thrive? And these questions really bothered me growing up, and I became increasingly curious about the challenges that girls face. And as I kept doing research, I realized it wasn't just empowering girls that I was passionate about, but it was empowering middle school girls. And we're talking about the age 11, 12, 13 years old. And many of us remember middle school as the most awkward years of our life. And I am no exception. Uh, this was me in middle school. <laughs> I was a total dork. Um, I'm hiding my full set of braces uh, in this photo. And um, for me, you know, research shows that in middle school, it's, you know, our bodies are changing. We, for girls, we get our period for the first time. We get a bra for the first time. We don't typically talk about these things because they're so awkward. And in middle school, they happen all at once, right? And uh, research shows that this is the age where our confidence levels tend to drop and our insecurities tend to rise. And for me, one of the things that I struggled with the most when I was in middle school was this need to be perfect. 
And many girls at this age become acutely aware of what other girls and what other people think of them, and that causes them to then think of, what do I think of myself? And when answering that question, I kept coming back to this idea of perfectionism. And I was plagued by it. And I had to get the best grades. And I would only raise my hand if I felt like I had the perfect and the correct answer, right? Or else I would not raise my hand. And when I wrote essays for school, I would write them in pencil and then write over them in pen and erase out all of the pencil marks from underneath. So my essay was just like a little bit neater and so this perfectionism plagued me and I think this quote really sums it up. This is by the CEO of Girls Who Code, Reshma Saujani, and she says, we're raising our girls to be perfect and our boys to be brave. And I think this starts at a really young age. I felt this in middle school, but I think there are many young girls where at a very young age, think of young boys who come from home from school and they have a rip in their jeans or dirt on their face and their hair's a little bit messy. And many families respond to this. This may not be your family, right? Your home may be different, but many narratives that we hear are families who respond to this and they say, oh my God, you had so much fun today. What did you do? Did you run the fastest? Did you jump so high? You were in the tan bark, you were in the playground, that's so cool. And girls come home and there's like a little dirt on her dress or her skirts, you know, a little twisted or her, she lost her bow or what, something happened and it's like, are you okay? Did something happen to you? Did someone push you? Do I need to call something? You know, it's like, let's get you cleaned up. And again, this isn't everyone's home, but this is a narrative that many girls grow up hearing and believing about themselves is that they need to be perfect. And so this plagued me throughout middle school and it plagued me throughout high school and it wasn't really until I got to college and I came to Stanford and I started studying in the design school there, the D school, and I took my first design thinking class and it totally rocked my world. It showed me an entirely new way of approaching things because suddenly, you know, design thinking on the surface is a tool for creative problem solving. It's a tool for understanding what people need and designing products and services that meet those needs. But underneath that, it's about risk taking. It's about coming up with a half-baked idea or prototype and putting it out there and not being afraid because you know it's not perfect. You know it's the roughest form of that prototype, but you still put it out there anyway and you got that feedback and you changed it. And for me as a freshman, like learning this process totally changed the way I not just saw products, but even my own future and what I could potentially do. And I kept thinking, God, if I could bring this to more middle school girls and how much I wish that I had learned this when I was younger. Because while perfectionism might lead to good grades, what it doesn't quite lend itself to, I think, is the type of bravery and risk taking that I think more girls need to grow up with if we want to empower more of these female change makers that the world so desperately needs right now. So I found my pathway. I was teaching design thinking and I brought these two areas together with a few Stanford women and we started in a nonprofit called Girl Possible. We started teaching these design thinking and leadership workshops for girls. And we just started calling up uh, middle schools. We called up Girls Middle School, Woodside, Menlo. Uh, these are all schools here in the Bay Area. And we said, hey, we're a bunch of students. We came up with this workshop. Um, would you be open to us coming to share this with some of the girls at your school? And many schools said no. And some schools said yes. And we started prototyping this curriculum. And before we knew it, you know, our first workshop started off really bad. It's like girls didn't want to be there. We didn't know what we were doing. And slowly we got better and we learned over time how to make these really impactful. And we started to feel like we were onto something. And we wanted to share this curriculum with more girls. And so we launched a Kickstarter fundraising campaign. We raised $35,000 from over 500 backers to do this, which is to hop in an RV and spend 14 weeks driving across the US teaching these design thinking and leadership workshops for about 1,200 girls across 32 states. This is our roadmap. So we started here in the Bay Area. We came up north through Oregon and Washington, came all the way to the East Coast. Um, through New York City, we parked the RV in New Jersey because you cannot park an RV in New York City. You can't make a U-turn in an RV, <laughs> um, let alone park it in the middle of uh, Manhattan. We came then down south through Georgia and then came um, all the way through Texas, Arizona, New Mexico, and back to the Bay. And this is what it looked like for us on the road. 
Just kidding, this was like five seconds of our journey because this is beautiful and most of our journey did not look um, quite this nice. Um, this was us driving through Arizona, but sometimes we would get up in the morning and check our GPS and we had, you have 300 miles to go and you will see nothing interesting. You will only talk, is basically what our GPS could have told us. And so we talked about life and we talked about girls and we talked about our work and we talked about uh, the, the cacti on this, you know, we talked anything that we could, right, and to make it to our next destination safely and still just as inspired to do the work. And at the end of every workshop, we would gather all the girls outside out to the RV and we would give them a ribbon and ask them to write down a message um, that they wanted to share with other girls around the country and then tie that ribbon somewhere on the RV so that we could bring it with us and they tied it on the back of the RV on bikes and on the windshield wipers, and then we had to take it off because <laughs> safety purposes. We basically said, tie the ribbon anywhere where it's not gonna hinder us from actually getting to our next destination, but you'd be surprised, they'll tie them anywhere. I mean, the look on their face was like, we can just tie it, I mean, and so this was the way that we celebrated um, the end of each workshop, and then we were off to our next destination. And we would always kick off each workshop by asking girls the same question. And chances are, this is a question that you've been asked too. Uh, and that question is, what do you want to be when you grow up? Uh, raise your hand if you've been asked this question before. Okay, that's almost everyone. Um, raise your hand if, as a kid, you loved getting asked this question. You were like, ask me again. I know exactly what I want to be. It's freaking awesome. I know it. Okay, yeah, we always get a few proud hands. We're like, yeah, I knew, and I'm doing it, right? No, maybe not, no, no. Change your mind, right, totally. Okay, raise your hand if you're still figuring it out. Okay, that's a lot of us, and we're grown-ups, right? Okay, so this question, I think, is pretty interesting because it's asking us to choose one specific thing, like doctor, or lawyer, or writer, or a musician. But in reality, the process of figuring out who we are and who we're gonna become when we grow up, as if in one moment we grow up, right? Like who came up with 18 years old? It's just like, you're an adult, like you're gonna become that thing. You know, in reality, these ideas are constantly changing. Like this is a lifelong conversation and it's one that I think we can be sparking with girls and adults alike in a much more positive and open-ended way. And so this became the crux of our workshop and we started asking girls a very different question instead. And that was, what kind of change do you wanna create in the world and how can you begin to achieve that dream today? And we started developing more tools and programming around this question. This led us to develop teaching toolkits, which are a series of essentially a workshop in a box that we ship out to educators, nonprofits, passionate moms and dads, college women and men, so on, so they can bring our curriculum to their own communities. We also last year launched our first summer camp. So we brought together 60 girls uh, back at Stanford where the, the idea was first born. It was a superhero themed program um, where we helped girls, um, not just in the two hours that we usually had in one workshop, but we spread it all week so that we could really dig deep into the areas of change that girls wanted to focus on and really give them the confidence to go after those. And at the end of the week, uh, after this camp was over, we're, um, I remember I was with my team and we're cleaning up the space and there's like confetti on the wall and like food wrappers on the ceiling, like you'd be surprised at how much middle school girls can tear up a space. And so we're cleaning, we're picking stuff up, we're like looking for our materials and we start this conversation about camp and we're starting to reflect and think to ourselves, like did it work? Like did it create the impact that we had set out to? And it's really hard to measure the impact of a summer camp. It's like everyone leaves and they're, they're overjoyed and they had a great time, but did it work? And initially, we thought our measure of success was going to be, you know, what percent of girls would leave our summer camp and still be pursuing the design thinking project that they had come up with? And so that was our metric, and we are, we're cleaning up the space and thinking about this and wondering and crossing our fingers, and we get to a point where um, we feel a buzz in our pockets and we pull out our phones like uh, classic millennials, like, who did I, who texted me? And we get this, message from a 13-year-old girl who attended our camp. 
this like long scrolling. This is one screenshot of a very long, it would take me several minutes to read this entire excerpt to you. So I'll just read you a little piece of it. She wrote, as you probably know, being a teenager isn't easy and it gets really easy to feel lonely. This camp did so much to make me and every one of us feel supported, even if it was just for a week. Camps usually forget to focus on the people, but this camp did a lot to make us feel confident and loved, which is something that girls especially have a hard time feeling. Thank you for having such an impact on my life. This camp gave me a family, and I can't tell you how warm that made me feel. So we came into this thinking, design thinking was the answer. We needed to teach girls how to use design thinking to create change. And while that was still the goal, we realized that the impact we were having was going to look and feel much different, um, similarly to the way that we felt when we first started learning design thinking. We were students ourselves. And I think it's hard to pinpoint an exact thing about this camp that, that made it happen, that was so successful. We might never know what it was about camp that worked so well for this camper and hopefully many others. But as we were reflecting on as a team, one theme consistently came back to us and that was around play. Now when many of us think of the word play, we think of something like this, like Legos, right? Now when I think of play, I think of this. Did anyone here else uh, play this game? Yes, this is Sims. I was addicted to Sims growing up. I told you how dorky I was as a middle schooler. This is probably where I spent most of my time. And uh, while most of us think of play in these ways, and that's right, you know, play includes these things, um, I think the impact of play goes much deeper and is much more diverse. And I work at IDEO as part of our play lab. Our team is split up into two halves. Um, the first half is um, made up of toy inventors who invent toys year round, and then they pitch them to companies like Mattel and Fisher Price and earn royalties on the toys that are sold. This is everything from Barbie dream campers to and camper vans to VR headsets and so on. And the other half of our team, which is the team that I'm on, is focused on leveraging the principles of play, what's so great about play, and bringing those to companies to help them solve different challenges in education and healthcare and beyond. And through our work, we've realized that play can create tremendous impact in these three key areas. Play helps to break down barriers, it transforms fear into curiosity and bravery, and it brings people together. And I wanna share a few quick examples of how powerful play can be. And one of those is with the hospital experience. When we think of hospitals, we do not typically think of play. When I think of a hospital, I think of a sterile and scary environment. I think of an environment that I don't wanna be in at all costs, because if I'm in the hospital, something is terribly wrong. And, but when we bring play into an experience that's typically this terrifying and intimidating, we can create some amazing outcomes for patients. Um, and one example um, relates to the MRI machine. And there was a designer, his name was Doug Dietz. He worked at GE Healthcare and he was working on the design of MRI machines. And he one day wanted to enter a hospital to see how his MRI machines were being used, make sure everything was going well, as a good designer does. And he came in expecting to see, you know, look out for certain things. He had his list of, you know, things that he was curious, was it working, was it not? But what he found was that, and that shocked him, was that young kids were coming into the room and at the sight of the MRI machine were bursting into tears. And they needed anesthesia to get their scan. And they were so uncomfortable the entire time, the parents kept saying, do we have to do it? And when you come to a hospital and you need a procedure to be done, the last thing you wanna be thinking is like, how do I get out of it? It's like, you're there to get the care that you need. And so how can we make that experience not just more joyful for kids, but even to improve their outcomes and make these screens even better. And what Doug did is he transformed this MRI machine into this adventure. He created a whole series of different adventures that you could go through an MRI machine. And this is the pirate ship experience, but there's also one where you feel like you're, you're, you're kind of camping and you step into a sleeping bag and you look up at a starry sky. And not only does this make it such a fun experience that kids are like, can I come back tomorrow? Can I get another scan tomorrow? But they don't require anesthesia, which means that it's less expensive and taxing and they can scan more kids per day and per week. Um, but also, because kids aren't scared, they're holding still. 
much more easily, which makes the scans higher quality. And so all of these things come from bringing a little bit of play into something that was typically really sterile and scary. Another example is, well, let's talk about death. Or let's not, because people hate to talk about death, right? It makes sense, it's depressing. And none of us want to think about death, but the reality is that we all die. Death happens to all of us. And we might say, many of us might believe that if we talked more about death, it might actually help us live our lives a little bit more fully day to day. And so there was a nonprofit that really latched onto this idea and wanted to bring play to one of the things that felt scariest to most people. And they did that by launching this, which was a week filled with events. This was actually held here in San Francisco um, about a month ago. There were 250 events packed into one week, including uh, comedy shows, VR simulations, live art mashups, like all kinds of amazing dance, uh, theater. I mean, they packed everything into this week to help start conversations about death that didn't feel as scary. And I was lucky enough to be part of one of these experiences two years ago where I walked into a room, it felt like a fake like purgatory, and I walked through several different, you know, someone read a eulogy to me. I mean, it was incredibly immersive. I was crying, and then I left, and I felt so relieved, like I could finally bring these topics up. And I had so many conversations that week with my loved ones about what happens when I die and what would they want for when they die. And suddenly that wasn't as scary anymore. So I think play can create real impact here. And one space that I've been getting really interested in is around sexual health care and education. Because when we think about the power of play to break down barriers and taboos, God, it's hard to imagine a space that's less filled with taboos or more filled with taboos than sexual health care and education. I mean, sex, contraception, tampons, like we don't say these words out loud very often because they're so awkward, because we're told we're not allowed to say these things. And But the reality is that we can think at one point that these are awkward, but the the way, the consequences of these taboos is that these taboos are preventing girls from staying in school. And these taboos are perpetuating dangerous myths and misconceptions about how contraception works, which leads to early unplanned pregnancy, which leads to more girls dropping out of school. I mean, in some cultures, some menstruating girls are still exiled to outdoor shut, uh, huts um, and sheds when they're on their period. They're not allowed to enter the kitchen, they're not allowed to make eye contact with certain people in their community. The fact that these taboos are holding back women and girls in so many ways, I can't imagine anything that would disempower girls more. I think this quote sums it up pretty well. This is, if men could menstruate and women could not, it would become an enviable, worthy, masculine event. Men would brag about how long and how much. Maybe we believe this, maybe we don't. This is written by Gloria Steinem, I think back in 1986. So she was onto something and we're still working on this. And I think this proves the point that this is, it's not, the problem isn't the period, the problem is that it happens to women. And that we still largely live in a world that's designed for men first. So I've been thinking a lot about ways to bring play into the space to change and break down these taboos and I've been drawing inspiration from all over and sometimes play is more explicit than in other places and in this case, um, it's a literal game. This is the period game. Has anyone here heard of the period game? Okay, it's a board game, you can order it. They're shipping them early 2020. This team is amazing and I called their founder the other day. I was like, tell me about the work that you're doing because this is rad. Like you're starting a conversation about play in periods that is so not scary because it's an actual game that you play. And I'll never forget what she told me. She said, you'd think that this is empowering just for girls, but we find the most success when we play this game in groups of boys and girls because there's nothing that breaks the ice more than having a boy pick up a card that says, I got my period, and he has to exclaim it loudly in order for the game to proceed. <laughs> right? So suddenly girls are like, oh my God, if a boy just said that next to me, maybe I can say it too. <laughs> like maybe I can tell my mom it already happened last year. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, let's talk about another example. This is, um, these are diva centers, which were, um, this is a project that um, our IDEO.org team worked on um, in Zambia. And the idea was to make the process of accessing contraceptive care and services way more accessible and comfortable. 
And so they thought, what were the types of places that women love to spend their time? What did women love to do? Let's design around those. And one example that came up, which is not, by the way, the only place that women like to spend time, but it is pretty fun, and that is a nail salon. And so they designed these nail salons where women could come in, get their nails done, and start conversations with each other about um, how they were imagining their futures. And these aspirational conversations um, would naturally turn into how are you um, planning out your pregnancy? Or how are you deciding when and how you want to have kids? And this would lead to conversations about contraception. And 82% of young women and girls who came to these diva centers got contraceptive services that they needed. These diva centers were also paired with these, asp these aspirational characters known as the divine divas where instead of leading with the scary side effects of birth control, it leads with ideas of who are you, almost like a personality quiz, and therefore, what type of contraception might be right for you? Because there are many types. Condoms for the every girl, the pill for the perfectionist, injection for the girl on the go. Like, who excites you? Who do you want to be? How do you identify? And based on that, um, let's talk about an inspiring story of who you're gonna become someday and how uh, contraception can enable you to live that life that you're dreaming of. So I've been thinking more and more about this space and next year I'll be taking a gap year. Uh, my last day at IDEO is next Friday, which is bittersweet. Um, and I'll be embarking on this year to collaborate with nonprofits that are directly impacting girls in the reproductive health sector. I'm so excited to learn from them. I'm just at the beginning of my process and scratching the surface, so if these topics interest you, please let me know. I'll be doing work with organizations in Uganda, in the Philippines, um, and in several other places in India, so I'd love to chat with you. If you've done work in these spaces, I have a lot to learn. I'm excited to build upon their work in different ways and start to surface some insights, and would love to chat with you more about what the journey will entail. I want to run one last quick activity. I'm sure I am so over time, so thank you for your patience. Um, I mentioned earlier that we would end our workshops um, on our road trip by having girls write a message on a ribbon that they wanted to share with other girls around the country. And today I brought some ribbons with me in the hopes that you might want to share a message with um, a community that I'll be working with next year. So we all know how great it can feel to receive another word of encouragement. We know how that feels. Um, I'm sure they would love to know how that feels and to get to know you a little bit better, too. So with that, um, thank you so much for listening. Um, I hope you'll follow along, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you.